Um, so I'm going to talk about mistletoe, which is our favorite parasite. Um, I thought it would be appropriate this time of the year uh, because it is the season for mistletoe, right? Um, though you might be surprised to know that mistletoe is a parasite. Um, I remember when I first learned that mistletoe was a parasite, I was an undergraduate taking a desert field ecology class and we were walking around the desert and we found a tree that had mistletoe in it. And uh, the professor at the time you know, said, yeah, that's, that's mistletoe. And I remember staring at it for what seemed like a long time thinking, really, mistletoe is a parasite? Little did I know that years later I would actually spend a lot of time studying mistletoe. <laughs> okay. uh, so I'm going to go through this talk, first talking a little bit about parasitic plants in general, and then we'll get to mistletoes. And once we talk about mistletoes, I'll start by talking about the folklore around mistletoes and why it seems that we might come to uh, kiss under it, under mis under it for Christmas. And then I'll talk a little bit about my research in dwarf mistletoe. Okay, so um, what is a parasite? Uh, a parasite is an association whereby uh, one organism takes some of its nutrition from another organism, usually at the detriment of that other organism. Um, when you think about a parasite, you might think about things like fungi or things like small little animals, but very rarely when you think about parasites do you think about plants as being a parasite, because parasite are, I mean, plants are primary producers, right? They're photosynthesizers. They, they give everything to us. Well, some do. Um, so there are some that are uh, uh, parasitic plants. So the definition of a parasitic plant is uh, one that has a connection through a root-like structure uh, to other plants. Now, there are some things that are not parasites that people sometimes get confused or think that they might be parasites. And one of them um, is a, a bromeliad. So if you know, I, so I bought a bromeliad here because I had one of those in the greenhouse and not mistletoe. Um, so a bromeliad is an epiphyte. Uh, and another example are things like uh, vines um, and such that, an ivy, things that use another plant for structural support. And so they don't actually do anything to the host, but they basically use it to get leverage, to maybe get a higher in the canopy to get more light. Bromeliads are really interesting because they have their roots kind of exposed to the air and they're able to get the water that they need from the atmosphere and, 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 and the minerals and such. Um, and so this one that I have, you can look at it uh, later, we don't want to put it in dirt. So you put it in dirt, it just retains too much water and that's just a way too much water for a bromeliad. So we have it in like wood chips or uh, this one might be in broken up old ceramic uh, or old clay pots. And so you get a little, it has structural support and it gets enough water. Another one that is kind of a parasite, but we don't really call it a parasitic plant. Instead we call it a mycotrope. A mycotrope is something that obtains its, its nutrients from mycorrhizae that are on other plants. And so an example is Indian pipe, which is right here. You can see it, it's not green, doesn't have any chlorophyll. And so it has an association like, like mycorrhizae. So if you know anything about mycorrhizae, you know, plants really rely on it as this relationship whereby the mycorrhizal fungus helps the plant obtain water and minerals from the soil. And in turn, the plant gives the, the, uh, the fungus the sugars that it needs. This one is a one-sided kind of deal. It will just tap into the mycorrhizae and it will take water and nutrients and it will take sugar that that fungus has gotten from another plant. Uh, another example of a mycotroph are some species of orchids. And basically all species of orchids at the seedling level. And so uh, orchids, their seeds require an association with a fungus in order to get some uh, nutrition to produce the seedling and then the young seedlings rely on that relationship until the orchid is older. And when the orchid is older, uh, most species can do their own photosynthesis. Some of them remain in this sort of mycotroph uh, phase. So these are things that we wouldn't consider uh, parasitic plants. Um, so the only ones that really are the parasitic plants are the ones that have a connection with a host, with another plant, through a root-like structure. Uh, so there are different types of parasitic plants. I'm going to give you a few big words. Um, 
But facultative parasite, this is one that does not require a host to complete its life cycle. It will live okay in the soil by itself, but if there is an appropriate host, it's a lot easier to steal than it is to kind of get your own. And an example is, this is a Samaria, which is a, a parasite of a conifer. Anyone tell me what this one is? Indian paintbrush, right? Indian paintbrush is just one of the uh, really very beautiful uh, plant, and it is a facultative parasite. You might often see it growing near sage. It taps into the roots of sage um, to, get, to get its water. And so sometimes these are hard to grow on your own uh, because they, you know, they prefer to be, uh, to be parasites. So if I planted some sage in my yard, I could get some paintbrush. You know, I've always wanted to do that, and I, I, I think that would work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. And so then there's an obligate parasite. This is one that requires a host to complete its life cycle. So this is no picking or choosing. It has to be um, a parasite. Okay. And so an example um, is this one. This one is Striga, and it is a root parasite of sorghum. Uh, another way that we can classify parasites is based on what it is that they steal from their host. Well, we have to think first of all, what is it that a plant needs? So, what does a plant need? Sunlight. It needs sunlight, right? What else? Water. Carbon dioxide, it needs water. water. Fast car. <laughs> it needs a fast car. <laughs> and so it needs water and minerals, right? And then it needs uh, carbon dioxide and it needs sun. Why does it need carbon dioxide and sun? For, for photosynthesis is where it makes its food, right? And so uh, the food is transported throughout the plant in a different system in which the water and minerals are transported through the plants. Now let's see if any of you remember into some of your botany. <laughs> Do you remember what the, the tissue that's called that transports water and minerals? Xylem. Xylem. Oh, you guys are pretty good. Xylem. Yeah. So xylem. And the one that transports food? Phloem. Good. Phloem. Right. So these are the two transport systems. And so if you look at this figure, it shows in blue the water moving up from the roots, water and minerals. And that's through the xylem. And then you've got the sugars being made with carbon dioxide and, and light, and the food uh, is being transported in this green line here. So that's the phloem. So some plants, some parasitic plants, only steal water. So they still make their own food, they photosynthesize, but they just steal water from their host. That's called a hemiparasite, one that just taps into the xylem and takes water. Uh, and then there's those that tap into both, steals both food and water, and these are called um, holoparasites. And so hemiparasites can be facultative or obligate, but a holoparasite has to be obligate. Right? So it means that it, if, it, if it's going to steal both food and water, it's going to need its host. It can't grow on its own. <coughs> so here's an example of a hemiparasite. This is a dwarf mistletoe um, here growing on a conifer. Uh, so it was a hemiparasite. I, I hope I said that. <laughs> this is a holoparasite. This is one of my favorites. This is called Rafflesia. Um, this is really pretty um, highly reduced in that all it is is a flower, and that's all it really needs. And most of the time, it's inside of its host. This flower is the biggest flower that's known. It's the size of a tire. So this oh. thing is, is pretty big. And it stinks uh, because it is pollinated by carrion flies and insects things that are looking for dead flesh, which is why it kind of looks that way in the middle. And then this one is, I think, really very cool looking because it doesn't look like a plant at all. Um, this one is a parasite on the root, roots of a prosopis. This is an Argentina. And so these are plants that are obligate. They steal both food and water by tapping into the roots of their host. Uh, another one that's an obligate parasite uh, that taps into both is a broom rape. Uh, this one parasitizes some well-known crop plants, things like sunflowers, uh, tomatoes, and beans. So if you're a regular plant, you are going to propagate by seed. 
and all you really have to do is get your seed into the soil and then your seedling grows and does everything. Now it's a little bit difficult if you're a parasitic plant, particularly if you are an obligate parasitic plant because you can't grow in the soil. You have to find a host. So what do you do? Um, so are there are three sort of thing, uh, things that, that plants employ, parasitic plants. One of them is they just have their radical, which is going to become their root, grow and grow and grow and grow until they hopefully run into a host. And then if they don't, they, they're going to die. Uh, the characteristic of this seed is they're usually larger. They have to have a lot of energy reserves in order to support that growth until hopefully they find a host. Um, another one is that they just lay in the soil and they wait and wait and wait until they find a chemical cue that's given off by their appropriate host plant and then they'll germinate and then they'll, their host is, is, is nearby. And so that one requires the seed to have a lot of uh, great longevity, it means it should be able to, to stay in the soil for a very long time. Um, <coughs> one of these examples is, is the daughter. Daughter is a really interesting parasitic plant. It parasitizes bean plants and it parasitizes tomatoes. And they've done some studies that they found that they actually have a preference. They prefer <coughs> tomatoes than, than beans. If they grow it near, near beans, they'll find their, their bean host and they'll be just happy. If they plant it and they have a tomato plant and a bean plant equidistant from where that seed was, 90% of the time they're going to go to the tomato plant. Tomatoes are tastier than beans. Uh, this is a fun video that shows a time-lapse video of how they do this pretty quickly. So this one doesn't have any sound, but you see these uh, seeds are germinating. And you can see as soon as they start to germinate, they start to kind of move around. They're looking for their host. <laughs> you can kind of see from the, the day night that the, the, the time lapse, it was probably a few days. And so here it is, I'm hugging around and they're going to sink. The, these roots are a little bit different and I'll talk about them in a, in a second. So you can see they're going to start to enlarge and swell and basically attack. Now the dogs actually kill the host. Yeah, they can't kill it they, right yeah, away. Yeah, they'll otherwise They'll kill it, well, they'll kill it, not right away, but yeah, they'll, they'll go for quite a while until the infection is really heavy, and then it'll kill the host. Mm -hmm. Cause what's the point but of then, you know, killing then your host? Die too, right? right, yeah. Well, then by that point, they will have propagated their seed and found another place to go. Um. <laughs> so, <laughs> that one is, is kind of fun. So yeah, there's, that's in the whole conundrum about being a parasite. You know, how virulent can you be um, without, you kill your host, you end up, you know, killing yourself. But the idea for a lot of these parasites is to live long enough to get their seed out. And so this goes a little bit to really show how some of them could just basically completely infest uh, the end. Mm -hmm. And I think the only way we can really get rid of it is if you physically remove it. Here's a cross section showing the roots um, inside. Okay. Uh oh, why do I have? Okay. Okay. So uh, the other one is uh, that they just have to be in contact with their host before they uh, they germinate. And so this is an example with, with most of the mistletoes. And here's uh, uh, the mistletoe that I work on, the dwarf mistletoe. <coughs> you see the seed up on the top there. It's made its way to the needle of its host. So it makes its way down through rainwater or gravity, and it makes contact with the branch is when it will germinate. <coughs> so here is a germinating seedling. And so it has to have a structure once it germinates to really stick onto that host so it can dig deep in there. 
this structure is called a holdfast. So you can see this seed here, this radical growing out, and then you have that swollen disc there at the corner. And it has this adhesive section that basically sticks on to the host. And then once it's stuck on, it's going to start to grow, um, push out, and penetrate through the cells. Um, here's, I think this is a, a, a fun picture of a parasite on another parasite. So this leaf, <laughs> this is a hyperparasite. So this is a leaf from a parasite, parasitic plant, and then here's another one on it, mm. that poor host. Mm -hmm. So once they've made that a, a, a contact, they will start to grow their, their root, which isn't really um, a root. Um, instead, it's called a hostorium. So this is one, what makes a vascular plant a uh, parasite, the presence of a hostorium, which is this root-like structure. And so these figures show, does that show a laser? Oh, it does a laser. Um, it shows a variety of types of hostoria, uh, these root-like connections kind of inside. This one is showing a cross-section of it uh, breaking through. Um, here it is from the tips. These are, this is one that's been excavated, um, also kind of peeled away, the hostoria. Here's another one basically making its way through the tissue. Uh, another one, and then finally, third. So a variety of these root-like structures infesting their host. Okay. I think daughter might be a little bit different as far as their, their roots go. Um, so they think that these hostoria probably evolved from adventitious roots. And so um, adventitious roots, you probably have experience with them at some point. Uh, if you've ever made a cutting of a plant and stuck it in water to let their roots grow, those roots are called adventitious roots. They're growing basically from the stem. And so the idea here is that these are adventitious roots gone wild type thing. It's really, they're really, really getting out of control there. Other things that we see in parasitic plants when you go from a non-parasitic plant to a facultative to a real obligate is we see things like a reduction in uh, female flowers. So here is a female flower of, of dwarf mistletoe, really very small, probably about the size of a pinky nail or, or half of that. Uh, they have increased fruit complexity. Some of them will have uh, an interesting means of dispersal. And this one is through hydrostatic pressure. So they build up this hydrostatic pressure in their fruit. Here's the fruit here. And then when it's ready, it just basically shoots out that sticky seed and then it, wherever it lands, hopefully on needles of other trees or maybe even feathers of birds or fur of animals that will then rub off onto these, these conifers. Um, and then they have a reduced seed, side, seed size. So that's one there. They also have a reduction to the elimination of leaves and as well as a decreased vascular complexity, meaning that you start off with a lot of veins and leaves and then you have very few veins in their leaves. And so there's kind of a regular leaf. Here's one that's more reduced and you can't really tell very well from the slide, but the vascular tissue, the vascular, the veins in it are really very reduced. Uh, to these leaves that aren't really leaves, they're more like scale, it's kind of flaps of the skin. And then two, again, one of my favorites is the one that doesn't have any leaves at all. It's just basically a big flower. Mm, this is kind of the exception to that idea of reduced, reduced flowers. And then, of course, reduced uh, root hair abundance. And this one makes, makes a lot of sense because the idea of root hairs is to increase the surface area so they can get more water. Well, if you're a paras parasitic plant and you're kind of in root, in your root is sort of drenched in the xylem that's just all water, you don't really need to have a lot of those root hairs. Uh, and then the other one is changes in the chloroplast. So what does the chloroplast do? Right, that's what chlorophyll is, and that's where the, the side of photosynthesis is. And so if you're a parasitic plant and you're not doing photosynthesis, then why do you need all that extra DNA, right? So sometimes we see decreased um, chloroplast genome. It's usually at less, less than half the size of other plants, so pretty small. Uh, before we get to mistletoes, I wanted to do this gallery of some of my favorite, just other, other parasitic plants. Um, the one on the top is broom rape. 
It parasitizes, so this one up here, it parasitizes um, huckleberries as well as uh, manzanita. This is another Rafflesia. You can tell this is one of my favorites. I'd love to see one of these in the, in, in the wild. Apparently they're hard to find. Uh, this one is a Balanophora, which parasitizes oak. Um, and this one is a Coronea, which parasitizes or has been known to parasitize both palm and bamboo simultaneously. Uh, this one is a Cyanomorium. This one parasitizes amaranth. Uh, and this one's kind of interesting because um, it's been used as a medicinal plant. It's known, it was known as a medicine box of treasures. And so um, this one is where they kind of took the idea of doctrine of signatures, is that whatever it looks like is probably what it heals. <laughs> so you might imagine <laughs> <laughs> what it's been used for, things like fertility <laughs> and such. Um, and then another Rafflesia. Uh, and then this one is um, Pilostyle, which is parasitizes uh, woody stemmed legumes. And then this one is uh, Mitrostemma, which parasitizes beech trees. Okay. So that's really all about parasites. And so mistletoe is a parasitic plant. And so it's kind of interesting to think we've got this, you know, parasites, you always think about parasites as kind of being the scourge of the earth. So why in the world would we hang it up and kiss under it? So there was a, there's a lot of different stories around, around mistletoe. Probably one of the more concrete is the um, way that the Druids had this, uh, their attitude toward this plant was that it was a very sacred plant. Um, and the idea was that it, um, parasitized oak, and oak was also a pretty revered tree for the Druids. And it, because in the winter, when the oak lost all of its leaves, the, the mistletoe on it retained its leaves and its colors, they believed that it embodied the soul of the oak tree. Um, and so it was very important in their winter solstice um, celebrations, so they would cut it during the, it was the sixth moon um, after the solstice, after the 21st, or oh, sorry, the sixth day after that. I think it's called the waxing moon. And they were really very careful about how they cut it. Uh, they used a golden sickle. You can see the sickle here. Here's another picture depicting the golden sickle. Um, and also it could not touch the ground. And so here's another picture of a, uh, the Druids on the top cutting it, and you can see they are this white cloth ready to catch it because it was not um, to touch the ground or it would lose um, some of its, its sacredness. Um, here's some other pictures showing those types of things. So cutting it, uh, catching it with the, the cloth, um, basically having this large ceremony around it. I also read in some places the ceremony was accompanied by the sacrifice of uh, two white oxen. Couldn't quite see what the significance of that was. And then here's a modern day ritual the Druids are doing, cutting some mistletoe. Um, also, some mythology, uh, Norse mythology, um, goes back to this goddess. Um, her name is Frigga um, or Frigg. She was known as the all-seer, which is why in this picture she's depicted with a third eye, that she could see the future, she couldn't change it, um, and she couldn't um, tell people about it. She was also known as the uh, goddess of love. She was the one that was beckoned during um, childbirth and such. She was also believed to, to be the one that spun the clouds and was responsible for, for storms and such, which is why probably one of the, the uses of mistletoe was to put it in your house to guard against um, uh, storms or fires from lightning. And so she had a son um, named Balder, who was the god of peace, and he was the most um, beloved god. And so here's where the, the, the story kind of breaks apart. You hear tons of different, different versions. And so in in one version, he had a dream that foresaw his death, and it frightened Frigga. Another one was that um, just she had a dream that, 
that he died and it frightened her. Another one is just that when he was born, he, she didn't want anything to happen to him. So she extracted a promise from all living things and all elements of the earth that they would not harm him. Right? Uh, but she overlooked the mistletoe. And there were two reasons, depending where you, you go, why she overlooked the mistletoe. One, she believed it was just a lowly plant. Um, another one was that she believed it was too young of a plant to actually extract a promise from. Um, well, Loki, the god of mischief, he uh, kind of found this loophole and decided that he would kill Balder and that he fashioned a, a spear from mistletoe and gave it to his brother who was blind and told him, you know, throw it at, at Balder. He, he can't kill him anyway because he's immortal. Um, well, it killed him. And uh, so there's a couple of paintings showing this one um, and then this one where he was killed by mistletoe. And again, this is the part where there's a lot of different things, stories about what happened after that. Some were that he, um, that someone had to go to hell to get him, H-E-L, and it was another type of a god, um, to bring him back. And that he said that if you can prom if you can get everybody to shed a tear for him, then I will bring him back. And everybody did but one, and they believed it was Loki in disguise. I don't know what Loki had against Balder, but he had something against him. And so the promise was failed, and he did not return. Um, in other legends, he returned after three days. Uh, Frigga was so grateful. But either way, it was that um, the mistletoe, rather than being kind of a symbol of, of death, it was to be a symbol of love, so kind of to turn turn the tables on what had happened to Balder, so it was a symbol of love. Uh, she had, in her mourning, she cried tears that became the fruits of the mistletoe. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's one of the stories. Uh, so this was really very popular in Norse mythology, and so it was a very revered plant in Norse mythology. So the Norse, whenever they were battling and they came to an area where there was mistletoe, they had to lay down their weapons and not fight until the next day. Um, and then there was also some reference to mistletoe in, in Romans, Roman literature. Um, Romans liked to party. <laughs> so this shows. So this is their, their festival to Saturn. Saturn was the um, god of, of agriculture. And so the things I read about this was that they, in order to appease, appease Saturn or please him, they performed fertility rituals underneath the mistletoe. So taking it a little farther than what we do today. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then uh, that was a good uh, the idea sort of picked up from uh, into, to Christianity. And so the idea was that the mistletoe was the, the plant or the wood that made Christ's cross. And that as punishment, uh, the plant was uh, made to be a parasite on other plants, um, oak being one of them. And oak was a more virtuous plant. So that was uh, the idea there. And so mistletoe, um, based on all of those, those different ideas about it, it was also known as all heal, uh, which meant that it was used uh, from curing anything for, or treating anything from um, epilepsy to cancer. They used it to treat um, infertility. Um, and one of the ideas was that it was because the um, berries um, kind of resembled sperm when you squeeze them. Um, so fertility, uh, but actually it can be used as a uh, abortant. So taking, and that's what Native Americans used um, arsithobium um, here in the United States as as an abortant. Um, and then, so that was also some another piece of literature I found that they think that's another reason it was associated with these fertility rit rituals because you could be very promiscuous and then you can um, have this abortant. Um, it's been used uh, in modern day um, medicine. Uh, they've really looked at it as a possible um, anti-cancer for its anti-cancer properties. And it's been studied pretty extensively. They have found some promise, but then they've also found some inconsistencies. And it's been a while since I've really delved into, the, delved into this literature. 
But when I did, it was interesting that they found some of the compounds that were the anti-cancer compounds were derived from the same mistletoe but on a different host. So if you had the same species of mistletoe, but you, you picked them from different hosts, mm -hmm. uh, it was only the ones parasitizing a certain host. Uh, but the host itself didn't make it. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was also kind of interesting. Uh, they also used it, uh, back to kind of traditional folklore, not medicinal, uh, they would use it to um, put in babies' cradles to keep evil away um, in, with their livestock uh, to prevent uh, mischievous fairies from messing, up, messing with their livestock. Um, also, they were to kept in houses uh, to make sure that love is retained within those the houses. So, taken all together, that's probably why it's incorporated as um, kissing under the, the mistletoe. Uh, some other traditions, once this, this was, uh, was taken, was that whenever someone was kissed under a mistletoe, you had to remove a berry. When all of the berries were gone, you had to burn that mistletoe to make sure that none of the goodwill that had happened between those people uh, backfired. <laughs> and in some places, they it would stay in the house and then be renewed every year also to make sure that there's goodwill around. Okay. So mistletoe, what's in the name? So where does the name come from? Well, let's talk a little bit about first how they disperse their seeds. So it looks like our seeds. This is a mistletoe. It can only exist in partnership with a tree, for it has no roots of its own. But this is a very one-sided relationship. The mistletoe has green leaves, so it can manufacture food, but it draws all the liquid it needs from the tree onto which it's fastened itself. The tree gets nothing from the arrangement. The mistletoe, in short, is a parasite. The mistletoe family has over a thousand species. Here in Australia alone, there are 75. So many and so widely dispersed that somewhere or another, there is always one in fruit. And that makes it possible for one bird to eat almost nothing else. The mistletoe bird knows exactly how to extract the fruit. <laughs> the bird digests the fleshy coating of the seed with extraordinary speed. It takes less than half an hour to travel from beak to bottom. The seed, when it emerges, is still phenomenally sticky and has to be wiped off, which suits mistletoe very well. The seed, when it comes out, remains attached to the bird's behind by a long sticky thread, and the bird has to have a special technique for breaking it. <laughs> Every time it needs to detach a seed, it has to perform this little dance. It's this stickiness that is the key to the mistletoe's success in getting from one tree to another. Once parked on a living branch, the seed quickly plugs itself in. Do you remember what that was called? Something Hold fast. It's the hold fast. Yep. With a connection to its host's liquid supply, it can build leaves and start making food for itself. Oops. Ah. 
This is enough. Okay. That's what I wanted to avoid, but. So the next one he talks about is really interesting. It's not a mistletoe, but it's actually called the, the, uh, it's called the Christmas tree because it is a um, tree that, it's this huge tree with these beautiful yellow flowers and it's called the Christmas tree because it flowers in December. Uh, but it's got these little roots that parasitize other, tr other plants, uh, things from even grasses, and it, it parasitizes them and makes this huge tree. It's, it's really kind of neat. Um, but I thought we'll just talk about the mistletoe. Okay, so. The term mistletoe has something to do with that uh, dispersal method. And so mistletoe comes from the old English um, mistletan or mistletan. Mist means dung, tang means twig or branch. So mistletoe means dung on a branch. <laughs> um, although there's a little bit of, of, of controversy because mistel actually means basil. So maybe basil branch or dung on a branch. Who knows? Mm. So mistletoe is not just confined to the mistletoe that we see hanging at Christmas time. Uh, mistletoe is a gen uh, generic term for any parasitic plants that occurs on the branches of woody, basically aerial branches. Um, so there are uh, about 1,306 species of mistletoes, and they look all very different. So here's a species of mistletoe um, from Argentina. Um, here's a species growing on saguaro cacti. Uh, this is another one uh, from, from Argentina. This is one in the showy mistletoe family. Uh, this is another one from the showy mistletoe family. Uh, this one is um, attracts hummingbirds. Um, and then there are some uh, that are here in the southwestern United States. Pretty, pretty reduced. Um, here's another type of a mistletoe. Uh, mistletoes can be pretty damaging. Um, if you get a really heavy infection, it can uh, really devastate and, and kill the tree, um, as you can see in some of these photos. Um. Uh, so dwarf mistletoe is the, the mistletoe that, that I work on. Um, it is a, a parasite of uh, conifers, mostly the, the pines. <coughs> um, it is dioecious, which means that it has male plants and female plants. So the male plants will only produce male flowers, and the female plants will only produce female flowers. And so here uh, you've got the male plant, and you can tell this is a female because it's got um, the fruits. Other than that, other times of the year, I find it very difficult to determine whether it's a male or a female. Um, Hawksworth and Weens, um, they did a lot of work on dwarf mistletoe. And so you'll see that this handout actually has, the, the author is, is Frank Hawksworth. They traveled all over the country, it seems like, or they gathered data on where mistletoe occurred kind of all over the place and documented it. And so that's what I used for my dissertation. I used to call it the mistletoe bible. You go to the back and you find where they collected the, all species of mistletoe. And so for my project, I had to go and, and get samples from its whole, di the whole distribution. And I would go to some sites that said that they were uh, cited 100 years ago, and they were still there. And so it was really very useful. And so here are its flowers. It's really very reduced flowers. They think that it might be pollinated uh, by wind, but also maybe by insects, by ants. Um, here are the fruits. Um, as I mentioned before, it, it, it ejects their seed um, so at about 27 meters per second. And they can go as far as, I think, 30 meters. You can get pretty far. And um, then sometimes they don't find their host. And I remember, this, this is a picture of me, when my mom, who's here. Uh, she went with me on some of my collecting trips as, a, as an undergraduate. And this was the first time I actually saw them in dispersing their seeds. And I was collecting, and I felt things hitting me, and I thought they were bugs. You know, I kept them. And then I so looked down, and it was a seed, and I was so excited to actually see a seed. I think my mom thought I was a little crazy. <laughs> And so, uh, as I already mentioned before, once it actually finds where it needs to go, it makes its way to the branch 
where it germinates. Um, but once it, it germinates and it gets in there, it stays in there for about four years before you actually see the first branches emerge. And so sometimes it's hard to tell if you have a, a mistletoe infection. Some researchers have been find, found a way to do DNA sampling to find if there's actually some in there if you can't see it. And then it takes a few more years before they're actually these large adults, larger adults to produce seeds. Okay, so um, what is some of the research um, that I do? Um, everything mistletoe or anything having to do remotely with mistletoe um, or even their hosts. Um, uh, the mistletoe that I work on is Arsithobium divaricatum, which parasitizes specifically pinion pines. This one, though, is not Arsithobium divaricatum. This one is Arsithobium vaginatum, which parasitizes ponderosa pine. So as a graduate student, I was really interested in genetics um, and evolutionary genetics and some of the things that genetics can tell us. And so as a, as a graduate student, I look, built something called a phylogeography, which is looking at the DNA signature and determining migration routes out of glacial refugia, which means that at some point when the climate was really very cold, the plants that are distributed the way they are today really couldn't have the same distribution. They had to kind of migrate um, into these regions that were more uh, apt for them to grow. And so uh, there were these um, hypothesized regions of refugia, one of them being um, here in Arizona and the other one being in Texas. And the way that they find these, I think, is really pretty fascinating, is by going through pack rat middens. And so if you know anything about pack rats or why we call Pearson who collects everything a pack rat, pack rats collect everything around them and they bring them into their nest. Every, every, any little thing, they bring it into their nest. Seeds, grass pieces, little vertebrae. And then um, in their nests, they urinate all on them and they preserve them basically for all time. So you can go and excavate these middens um, and you can carbon date them and find out how old they are. And you can then sift through them and you can identify plant parts and animal parts, and so you get a really good idea of what was where and when. I don't understand how those people can sift through it, because I actually visited a lab in Arizona, and this woman was just an expert. She could take these little seeds, and she could tell you exactly what they were. And I'd you know, been looking at mistletoe seeds forever, and I still couldn't really tell what was a mistletoe seed. But so based on that, I did uh, sampled all of these populations, I took 10 from each population, uh, looked at non-coding regions of the chloroplast uh, to look for genetic variation and found these kind of three major groups. Kind of. So this uh, red group here, they all had similar uh, DNA types. These yellow had similar DNA types and these green ones did. And so this was really great because at least the yellow and the green um, seem to support that the hypothesis that there was a refugium here and here, and then the mistletoe that we see in the red migrated out of this one, and the one in the yellow migrated out of this one. Well, this one was, con was kind of interesting, but then I found after going to Arizona and talking to the people who study middens that they had found a midden with mistletoe here in Baja, California. They just hadn't published it yet. And so we knew that then there was a third refugium, and our data really supports that. Now, the only thing that was, see anything kind of interesting here? We get this star, who, if you look at it, it's really very different. Um, now, I don't know, um, I don't really want to explain this tree too much, but the idea is that these guys are pretty similar. These guys are pretty similar because they have really kind of short lines between them. This one is, is a lot more different, but this guy is just really kind of out of the water different. Um, so one of the things that, that we're doing um, is, is I have a student, Vance. Vance is here. Yeah. And so he's looking at that population um, even <coughs> further. And he's looking, uh, so he's been sequencing nuclear DNA to see how um, different um, it, it might be. And and it's really, we just got some results a couple weeks ago and found that it is really 
pretty different. Um, as a matter of fact, the sequence divergence is a, s a little bit more than the sequence divergence of the same region between subspecies of, uh, of uh, vaginatum, the mistletoe on, on ponderosa. So that was really interesting. One of the other things that he's going to look at is um, horizontal gene transfer, and that's where genes move from the host into the parasite or vice versa. And so some of the research I did as a, as a, uh, as a graduate student seemed to suggest that might be happening. So Vance is going to look at that further next semester. Um, another thing that I'm really interested in is the ecology is basically how does the mistletoe affect its host? And so uh, we did a big study in my plant ecology class last fall. Uh, we went out to a population that, that <coughs> I had studied it before as a, as a graduate student. And we collected lots of data. We collected needles from infected and uninfected trees, uh, cones, counted the number of cones, weighed the cones, measured them. Uh, we took tree cores to see if to count, uh, to measure the annual growth. And we also took bark samples to look at differences of pH. And so some of the things that we found is that there is a difference between infected and uninfected when you see needle size. So the infected needles are smaller than the uninfected needles. There was no difference in cone number, so the cone production is the same. But then um, Tracy, she went out and she collected a lot of different cones from different places, measured them and weighed them, and found that they definitely are smaller um, than in, in infected trees than in uninfected trees. Uh, one thing that I found was really exciting was there's a difference in pH between infected and uninfected trees. And that goes along with a study that showed that the um, microbiota, so like the bacteria and fungi, around trees that are infected and uninfected are different. So maybe that might be tied in with the, mistletoe, the pH changes that we're seeing. And so those are just a, a lot of different things that, that we did. And I hope to, to get it together, uh, maybe do it a few more times and um, uh, submit it as a, a paper. Um, another thing I'm curious about is how much photosynthesis does it do? And so this one is interesting because mistletoes are considered hemiparasites. And if you remember, a hemiparasite only steals water. Well, this one's kind of strange because it also steals some food. So this is one of those that's kind of in the middle there. Because it does some of its own photosynthesis, but it also steals some of its food. So one of the questions is how much photosynthesis does it do? And so um, when I was at, at Mesa State, or I guess now CIMU, I had a student, um, Ryan Tooker, who was interested in, in doing this. Actually, he really wasn't, wasn't really interested in, in research, or he didn't know much about research. Um, but he was very bright, and I asked him to help me with this project. And he really did a great job, and he decided to go to graduate school um, because of it. What was interesting, though, is, because, is that he ended up going into a neuroscience program um, instead of plants, which is the op exact opposite of what I did, because as a, I did my master's in neuroscience, the same neuroscience program that he's in now. <laughs> so this is the site. He went to uh, this, this place, which was only about oh, uh, 15 minutes from campus, and he would collect mistletoe on pinion, and then another species of mistletoe, mistletoe on juniper, which is a lot more green, and it seems like maybe it would do more photosynthesis. And so he did this every month for about a year and a half, two years, and found that the mistletoe on pinion does a lot more photosynthesis than the mistletoe on, on juniper, which I thought was really interesting. And then, as I said, he did this every month, and we found that there were seasonal variations. So the blue is the mistletoe on pinion, and the red is the mistletoe on, on juniper. Really peaks its, mistle, its uh, photosynthesis in May. Um, and so a couple things happen then. While well, one, it's the beginning of summer. Maybe it's just kind of revving up. But also, it does its, its my, undergoes meiosis later that month. And so maybe it's actually making more, getting more energy to get ready to go for that um, meiosis event. So that's one thing I want to continue doing here because there's a mistletoe. The mistletoe on Ponderosa undergoes meiosis in February. So it'd be interesting to see if we see similar patterns or, or, or different patterns. Um, and then some work I did as a, as a graduate student with my advisor. Um, he, we looked at pinion pine, um, so pinus edulis, 
and looked at a particular genotype. So there's this particular gene that in previous studies he found had different frequencies depending upon whether it, that area had a lot of rainfall or little rainfall and found that it was really correlated that you had a higher abundance of allele that we called 3 at a dry site and we had a higher abundance of uh, allele 2 that we at a wet site. And so I was interested to see if there was a difference between um, alleles and mistletoe infection. So at that same site that I took my plant ecology class to, uh, but several years earlier as a graduate student, I looked at this and we labeled 100 trees, 50 that were infected and 50 that were uninfected, and then we looked at their genotype and found that this, there was a significant difference that trees that were infected had a higher proportion of allele 3 uh, than non-infected, which had more of the allele 2. So one of the questions was, do these plants that have different genotypes deal with their water differently? Are some of them better than others? And so uh, this is also uh, research I did at, at Mesa with uh, Ryan, Amanda, and um, Kate that we looked at water potential. And we did definitely find um, a correlation in that there was, very, there was differences between um, the genotype and their water potential. And so what this really means, we're not sure, so we're going to keep working um, on this. Um, and so any other questions? I think there are some other things I'm interested in as far as um, plant hormones. So they found, you, you see that some plants that have a mistletoe infection uh, create what are called witch's brooms, which are these kind of like tumors of the branches, get really small little bulbs. And so it's believed that it's... Um, a plant hormone it's called cytokinin that increases this, this growth. And so some of my questions are, where does it come from? Is it that the mistletoe is basically um, putting it into the host, or is it somehow making the host uh, increase it? So there's some questions that have kind of a chemistry bridge that I think would be kind of interesting. So as I said, anything having to do with mistletoe at all or, or, or its host is what I'd like to work on, and it also is really nice because it gives a breadth of interest to students who might want to do research. So, I um, mean, you know, Vance is more interested in the molecular side of things, so we have this project where he can do PCR and do molecular. If someone's interested in ecology, we can then look at the effects on the host, and so that's why I really like this project for um, undergraduate research. Okay, are there any questions? <laughs>